Okay, be turning your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Now, the person we're studying the Bible with is who? Miguel. Right? And we went up to Miguel and we asked Miguel to study the Bible. And the first study we did was what? Seeking God, right? And we challenged Miguel to seek God with all of his heart. Okay, so then after that, we did the next study with him because you got to know something in order to seek God. You got to know what? The word of God. You got to know the word of God. So we did the word of God study. What is the word of God? You sure about that? Okay, uh, the Eastwood sounds, I don't know. Maybe that's why that was a good. What is the word of God? The Bible is the word of God. Okay, how many books in the Bible? 66. Okay. Right. There's 66 books. And it was written on how many different uh, continents? Three. Three. Which ones? Africa. Africa. Amen. Europe and where? And Asia. Great job. Uh, it was written by uh, about how many different writers? 40. 40. Okay. Uh, written over, uh, written by politicians, written by statesmen, written by tax collectors, which were the equivalent of drug dealers. Uh, it was written by, you know, the, God chooses some, some dubious characters and he uses them. Uh, in fact, Jesus has about, a, 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 well, he's got for sure one prostitute in his lineage. Uh, I believe he has three, but he has one prostitute, uh, which would be Rahab in the book of Matthew. So Jesus identifies with the lowest of class. Uh, in society. So the word of God is awesome. And we challenged uh, Miguel to go by the word of his emotions, right? We challenged him to go by what? The word of God. And the word of God does what in Hebrews 4? It cuts. Okay. So the Bible's compared to the Roman what? Gladius. The Roman Gladius. The Roman Gladius was the sword that did what? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Who said it over here? Who said that? Right there in the back. Okay, listen. Yeah, the sword that conquered the world was the Roman gladius. There were two swords. It was a long one and it was a short one. The gladius was about this long. It was short. It was said to be the, this, because they, the Romans conquered the world with the Roman gladius. And so when Paul writes, or the Hebrew writer rather, writes that the word of God cuts you, uh, he, he's comparing it to the, the Roman gladius. Uh, so then after we go through the word of God study, uh, that one, uh, there was another scripture in the word of God study that says you got to watch your life and your closely. Okay. So when you make a disciple, you're not just trying to help somebody to know the right doctrine. You're trying to help them. What live righteously. Who's someone said in the back, something to back it up to live it out. You, you're going to, you're going to meet people that you study the Bible with. They're going to believe everything and not do any of it. They're going to believe it. Oh, yeah, I got to do that. But they're not going to have the doc. They're not going to have a life that backs up what they believe. You're going to, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'm seeking God with all my heart. Yeah, I'm blessed. I'm very happy. What? I, I mean, I can't. Well, I don't expect you. Know, I'm supposed to be like you guys all fired up and everything. I'm just doing me. That's the problem. You need to stop doing you. You need to be like Jesus. Right. So those are things you got to address. Life and doctrine is important. OK, so we ask Miguel, are you willing to live? And at the end of the word study, the, the thrust is to make them aware that they are to live their lives based on the word of God. Does that make sense? OK, and that always ask, begs the question, are you living your life based on the word of God? OK, so then after that, we did what study? Discipleship. In, in other words, another title for discipleship is, is who's saved and who's lost. lost. If you're not a disciple, are you saved? If you're a disciple, you're lost. If you're a Christian, you're lost. If you're a Christian, you're not a disciple. But if you're a disciple, you're saved, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. So a disciple equals Christian equals not saved. So a disciple equals a Christian equals not saved. Okay, so if you're not saved, that means you're a Christian, but you are a disciple. No, a disciple, a disciple... A disciple is equal to did Jesus. How many disciples, how many Christians did Jesus make? How many Christians did Jesus make? Caught him right there, huh? How many Christians did Jesus make? No, he made no Christians. He made disciples. 
right? Yeah, we know it's the same thing, but you need to know your Bible is strong. Jesus didn't make, where does it say go make Christians? Doesn't say that. What does it say go make? Disciples, okay? Now, this is a secret little insight for you. When we first began the church uh, back in the 70s, you know how many people taught discipleship? Nobody. Nobody. You couldn't Google it. You couldn't no one. Now you got all kinds of churches. Yeah, it's all about discipleship. Right. Simply because we've pretty much gone all around the world. Right. You have you even have Catholic churches talk about discipleship. They never talked about discipleship. Right. So anyway, so Jesus never made a Christian. But the word Christian was used how many years after Jesus said to go make disciples? About, about 13 to 14. So for the first 13 to 14 years, what did the disciples make? Isn't that a great segue into the study to tell them for 13 years, nobody was made a Christian for three years during Jesus ministry. Nobody was made a Christian. And then what chapter do the Christians start or the disciples start getting called Christians? What chapter? Acts seven. Acts 11. Okay. And Luke highlights that the disciples were called Christians first at. Antioch was the Jewish capital or Gentile capital? Gentile. In other words, the atheist capital. So God's people needed time to build up to be able to really start getting the atheist. Okay, but they started influencing Antioch. Antioch was known for, you know, just no belief in, in God. But, and that's where they start getting criticized. They start getting called, you know, Christ-like. You're like Christian. So was Christian a positive term or a negative term? Negative. So they get called Christians. Before they were Christians, what were they? disciples okay so then you tell miguel as we did in the study the rest of the study we're just going to let jesus define what it means to be a disciple and you got to ask yourself a question are you saved or are you lost okay are you saved or are you lost now before we did this we did the timeline with him you guys remember timeline right what are some great questions to ask before you go into the study for the spiritual timeline when did you first believe that's an awesome question. Are you a Christian or are you a disciple? And you write down the, na- the, the time when they say that. Mercy. When, oh, this is big here. And, and you can, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? I have had people write, I, became, I started believing at 15. I, got, I became a Christian at 16, and I just caught the Holy Spirit when I came to your church. I have had people tell me they caught the Holy Spirit, and then they became a Christian. How in the world you catch the Holy Spirit like it's something, like it's a basketball in America or something. They're like, oh, I caught the Holy Spirit real quick. You can't catch the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay, uh, Dorcas. Say it again. When were you baptized? That's a great question to write down. Okay, uh, mess up. Okay, that's huge. Most people don't put that on the timeline. I do that right away. Have you made a disciple? And how many? And are they faithful? Do you know that we've had people, we had a guy in this church, everything we've said he did. He studied and did everything. He was taught to make a disciple. But you know what got him? He goes, but I never made a disciple. So I'm not a disciple. And that's the only thing on the timeline that really convicted his heart. And he wound up studying the Bible, Nigerian guy, and getting baptized. His name is Charles Anate. He was one of the main AMS guys for the beginning of the church, and he's now cranking in Toronto. Yeah, so you need to ask the right questions, okay? You need to ask the right questions. A couple more good questions. This is huge. When did you repent from your sins? Some people have never been asked when they repented, and then people tell you, I don't know. (laughs) You must be in sin. (laughs) You don't know when you repented, right? Okay, a couple more. Ah, do you speak in tongues or have you spoken tongue? Okay. At what point did you become a Christian? This is huge. Some people believe all this stuff. Got the Holy Spirit, believe, blah, blah, blah. blah. But, I, but, but the point I became a Christian was at this point. And they have a differing time when they believe they become a Christian than what the Bible would say. At our last one. When were your sins forgiven? Some people think you can pray your sins away. You cannot pray your sins away, right? Some people say, hey, I confess them to the priest. The priest is not Jesus. 
When were your sins? And we know from the Bible the sins are only taken away at baptism. So you, we did all those questions. And you need to be confident, guys. When you study with people, you have to pull out what they said. Okay? This is your testimony. You told us this. And you have to be careful with religious people because religious people, religious people, man. They will see the study leading towards them being lost and they will shift those answers in a heartbeat. They will go, they, you will ask them when they became a disciple and then they'll tell you and then you'll be going through the study and they'll be going, well, you know what I said earlier, I really, what I really meant to say, what, 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 I mean, uh, you know, what had happened was, no, no, you, you, you said this is when. So you got to hold people to that and you'll need to use that timeline. Okay. But in this case, Miguel sees he's not saved. He wants to become a disciple and you have to bring it home, not out of meanness, but out of conviction. And so you ask the question. So if you left here today, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And Miguel goes, man, I wouldn't make it. I, I, I wouldn't. I'm not saved. So I go to, okay. Last question. Who do you know that's a disciple? If he goes, oh, yeah, my mom. <laughs> you got to start over. You got to start over. Uh, and I like to appeal to people and I like to persuade people to see the truth. OK, you have to appeal and persuade. Uh, it's one thing for you to go to the doctor and them tell you need the surgery. You want some proof like, OK, show me some x-rays. Show me where I got some infection. Well, I'm not just going to get surgery because you said it. But once you see and the doctor will say, you see, you see this right here. Yeah, this is where the cancer is. And uh, if we cut it out, it's going to be painful, but it'll heal you. Well, what if we don't cut it out? Well, you, you got you know, a year to live. But it's, it's going to be great. You have 365 days. You know, you can go. to. I got a year to live. Yeah. I want to live longer than that. Yeah, I would too. Well, can you cut it out? I, I sure can. As long as you see that it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're doing when you're studying the Bible with people. You're not just telling them you're lost. You're this, you're that. You, you got to use your wit, your skill, other scriptures, persuasion to help them see their own lostness so that they value studying the Bible more than you value studying with them. So that they are more urgent to study the Bible than you are urgent with them. Does that make sense? You yeah. studied the Bible with a guy uh, that was this way. He started seeing his own heart in the Bible because we took the time to help him see his own heart in the Bible. And he started, when, when people do that, they get conviction on their own. Okay, you don't have to tell them to do stuff. They get conviction on their own. They start moving their schedule. They're doing everything to make it happen. And uh, it was awesome. This is, this is exactly what Ben did and Ben got baptized. Ben got baptized, you know, and what's awesome is the same heart was the guy that met him. Ola. Ola did the same thing and Ola got baptized. <clears throat> Moving things around, shifting things, you know, same thing. Matt started seeing, I need this. I need this. I remember Matt first came around. He saw, he saw Sean O'Farrell up there saying, hey, I'm giving up everything. I'm going to Ireland. And Matt goes, I'm going to the pub. No, he didn't go to the pub. But he's like, I'm out of here. This is too radical, you know. But then he thought about it. And he came back. He goes, no, I need God, man. I want God to bless my life. And, 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 and Matt came back. And Matt studied the Bible. He's a sold-out disciple today. <laughs> and, and, and th th you know, when, when you help someone see they're lost, that's different from telling them they're lost. I really want to persuade you to that. You got to help them see it. And then you can easily say at the end of it, and I do this all the time if you've ever been in study with me. I'll go, so do you see yourself as a disciple? And they go, yeah. And I go, okay, awesome. And they go, so what's the next study? Well, we probably have to do this one again. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, I don't want to hurt your feelings here, but I want to be honest with you. And then they go, okay, well, sure. No, go ahead and tell me. Well, I don't want to hurt you, though. No, no, tell me. Okay, I, I believe this with all my heart, like zero, like there's no gray area. I don't have to pray about this, any of that. I believe you are absolutely and totally lost. Not like kind of lost, like you are not a disciple. You're the furthest thing from a disciple. You're not like kind of a disciple, maybe a disciple. You're like not a disciple at all. How do I know that? Number one, you don't share your faith. You didn't invite us. You didn't ask us to study the Bible. We're studying with you. Um, we just did a timeline with you. You said you got the Holy Spirit here and you cut the tongues here. You baptize as a baby and all this stuff. So there's so so your conversion is not in the Bible. I know how you feel, but it, it, but but I believe you are absolutely not saved. Now, I know that's not what you believe. But that's the problem. We got to get to where you see the same truth in the word of God that I see. 
Because right now, from a, an emotional standpoint, you believe you're saved. But from a logical and biblical and an honest standpoint, even you've shared here in your timeline, all these things that don't go with the Bible. It's very clear you're not saved. But I don't want you to like think it's me saying this. I want you to see it biblically. Like nobody got the Holy Spirit at 12 and they got baptized here and did the, the way you became a Christian, you can't find it in the Bible. It's not a model. Of, that, that's not how people become Christian in the Bible. It's not how it happened. I've given that talk to people. You know what they've said? I've had two responses. The first response is, you're right. What do I need to do? The other response is, yep, yeah, I believe I'm saved. Awesome. Okay, well, great. Well, let's just end the study right there. And um, maybe we get together again and we can pray together. You know. Well, are we going to do more studies? Nah, because you, you, I think you, you, you don't really see it. And then at that stage, you can get some advice as to what, what, what study to go to. But you got to help people see their lostness, not just tell them they're lost. I want to drill that home. Does that make sense? Okay, so Miguel sees he's lost. We did the light and darkness study. In other words, sin and what does it mean to repent? It means if you're smoking, you keep smoking, right? Okay, it means if you're looking at pornography on your phone, keep looking at pornography on your phone. No, what does it mean to repent? What if you can't stop looking at pornography in you, it, it, but on your phone? Get rid of the phone. Okay? What if you can't become a Christian unless your boyfriend becomes, you don't know, I don't know, my boyfriend. What do, what do you got to do with the boyfriend? Break up. What if your girlfriend, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't see anyone in the chair. What do you got to do? You got to break up. When things are falling apart, they're falling in place. Sometimes you feel like they're falling apart, they're falling in place. Right? I would rather break up my girlfriend and marry my wife anyway. It'd be better for you to break up with some boyfriend who's enjoying the benefits of what marriage should give you for free. He's just enjoying you, even though he doesn't want to be with you. Right. It's better to give that up and marry a husband that God has picked out for you. Does that make sense? So you need to have confidence to tell people that. Right. And, and you see it. You, you will see it. You will get someone that is so fired up to study the Bible, and then they go, but my girlfriend. But my boyfriend. And that's where you dress that at the light and darkness study. Okay, you help them see you got to repent. You got you to cut it off and, 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 and stop. Okay, and stop. Um, I can't do it. Yeah, 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 you can. With God, all things are possible. With you, you can't do it. But with God, if you pray, if you fast, if you come to church, if you do all the things that God says... You can do it. You have to explain it and break it down. To say with God, all things are possible, that's kind of religious. You have to make it practical. With God, all things are possible. That means with prayer, with reading the Bible, with coming to church, with being around other disciples, with sharing your faith, with God, with God's people, with God. Okay, it's possible to do it. On your own, can't do it. But with God, you can do it. Okay, so you address that. He did a sin list. You remember that? Okay, Miguel did a sin list, and he came back, and he read it out to all the brothers. But guess what we did before he read it out? You shared your most embarrassing sin first. Right? You guys all believe in that, right? Yeah. You'd never be a hypocrite and call people to do something you're not willing to do, right? Okay, so from here on out, never do a Bible study if you're not, you don't share your, you don't, definitely don't do light and darkness without sharing your sins with them first. Does that make sense? And you can be quick. Go around and have everybody share, and then you have them share briefly, and then they do a sin list. Now, if they come back with a little uh, post-it note with a couple things they wrote on it, don't laugh too loud, but send them back to redo it over again, okay? And really get detailed about writing down how their sin affected God, other people, and them, okay? And each individual sin, and so he does a sin list, okay? And so, so we've done light and darkness first because this person... It was a little bit more hard-hearted. You could feel it. And, and so now they're not only broken, not only wanting to repent, they want to be a part of the kingdom. So now we've come to the time where we do the coming of the kingdom study for Miguel. Amen? Okay. That was a little recap. So we turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Now you got to set this study up simply. You say, Miguel, this is going to be an awesome study. It's called the coming of the kingdom. And it's going to answer a few questions. What is the kingdom of God? It's going to answer, when did the kingdom of God come? 
Who's in the kingdom? How do you get in it? It's going to answer those questions. Okay? And you ask him before you get into it, what is the kingdom of God? Miguel goes, oh, that's easy. I know this one. It's heaven. You go, Miguel, you are absolutely wrong. Because you're partially right. The kingdom is heaven, but the kingdom is more than just heaven. And so because you don't know exactly what the kingdom is, we're going to teach you what the kingdom is through the Bible. Okay? You got to call people on stuff like that. You got to call people. I've even done the word study asking someone what the word of God is. And you know what they've said to me? My mere natural instinct. Some people say, you hear it all the time. Yeah, I got a word from God. No, you didn't. You had something. You had something on your, you had your mere natural instinct. A word from God is not your emotions. I got a word from God. What are you talking about? What, where is, what are you looking for? This word from God, you found some, some, no, the word of God is the Bible. Okay, you can't let people get away with stuff like that. Okay. Are you with me there? Same with, with the kingdom. If they don't know what the kingdom is, how are you, how you going to be in it? If you don't know what the kingdom is, how do you know when it came? If you don't know what the kingdom is, how do you know you're inside of it? If you don't know what it is, you got to know what the kingdom of God is. And since Miguel goes, I don't really know, it's heaven, you tell him that he's wrong, but don't worry, we're going to show you. And then you, and you break it down, you go, okay, here's the deal. We're going to show you puzzle pieces from the Old Testament and puzzle pieces for the New Testament to complete the picture of the kingdom. That is it. We're going to show you two puzzle pieces from the Old Testament, several from the new, how they all fit together to show you what the kingdom is, to show you how to get in the kingdom, to show you who is in the kingdom. And that's the end of this study. Now, this study is going to be a teaching study, less questions back and forth, unless I don't think you're understanding where I'm going with it. But, but trust me, at the end of it, you're going to see the clear picture of the kingdom. And you said, Miguel, basically what happened with God's people is they fought for freedom. They fought to be able to be the dominant people group on earth. And it took them a thousand years to gain it all. By 1000 BC, King David had unified all of God's people at a particular place that had never been conquered called Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 2 Samuel chapter 5. He had unified God, so it took a thousand years for them to gain it all. But then guess what happened? They started losing it faster than they gained it. And we learned that you can gain it all. You can lose it all faster than you gain it. And so we come to a time 300 years later where they, they, they are literally discouraged because they've lost the power of the kingdom. King David was reigning 1000 BC. The height of Israel's glory was when he was reigning. And now we come to a time where they're a bit discouraged. They're not the dominant group. They're not. Can you imagine if, the, you know, the whole world right now was 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 full of Christianity in a sense that, the, the you know, there was no atheism and, and so on and so forth. So th that, that's kind of what happened with the Israelites. And we get to this time where, where, where that actually has changed. And we get to 750 B.C. and a prophet comes to give them hope. That's what prophets do. They come to give you hope in a hopeless situation. And Isaiah says something here in Isaiah chapter two. It says, in the last days, in verse 2, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountain or mountains. Mountains, plural. It will be raised above the hills and some nations will stream to it. Some people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. No, it says many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from where? Mexico? Liverpool? No, it says the law will go out from where? Zion, which is Jerusalem. The word of the Lord from where? Jerusalem. Verse 4 says he will judge between the nations. And will settle disputes for many people. In other words, there will be national peace. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. And the church said, Amen. right here, we find great symbolism in the book of Isaiah. Mountains are always symbolic for kingdoms. And the Bible tells you something about mountains here. It says in the last days. So now we have a time marker. 
the last days. It says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple or the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Lord's temple will be established. So when will the kingdom of God be established? In the last days. Now, we don't know what they are. We'll find out in the New Testament. But right here, it says the kingdom of God will be established in the last days. We know it's not the last days of mankind or I wouldn't be giving a speech. It's the last days. It means something else. So in the last days, the kingdom of God will be established. In the last days, the kingdom of God will be established. And it says it will be it will be raised above the hills and some nations will stream to it. Do streams naturally go uphill or downhill? Downhill. This will be supernatural flow. Greater than Paul Tulumba. I mean, it will be supernatural. Okay? Because the Bible says nations will stream up to it. Any river that streams upstream is a supernatural stream. Does that make sense? So this will be a supernatural streaming. This will be something supernatural. That means it's not natural. Okay? It won't be natural for all nations to be streaming to it, but this is what's going to happen. It says, many people will come, say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God. He will teach us his ways. Okay. Why are they going up to the mountain of the Lord? To be taught. That's what it says right there. To be taught. Okay. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And then it says in verse four, you don't always have to read this, but if you like, verse four says he will judge between nations and settle disputes for many people. Okay. This will be a peaceful kingdom, a peaceful kingdom. You always got to ask yourself, are you at peace? (laughs) So we find out some things about the kingdom. Number one, it's going to happen when the last days we find the city, Jerusalem, we find what's going to go on teaching and we find what mountain, what kingdom will be the greatest it will be the kingdom of god god's kingdom god's kingdom so now let's go all the way into the future to daniel who never knew isaiah let's look at another prophecy how in the world this guy they didn't even know each other and they're still giving prophecies about the kingdom that tells you that the bible is not only a historic book it's a prophetic book daniel chapter 2 daniel chapter 2 the word daniel means god is my judge i hope you believe god is your judge Daniel was incredible. God's people had been exiled. And yet, even though they were exiled and it was against the law to go by the Bible, Daniel still turned and faced Jerusalem and prayed. (laughs) This guy was bold. And Nebuchadnezzar was the, the, he was the world power at that time. And he had a wicked dream. Okay. He had a wicked dream. And the dream uh, disturbed him. You know, sometimes you are so busy and so unfocused to listen to God he has to speak to you in dreams and so that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar and he had some false prophets around him that claimed that they could interpret the dream but he said something to them that was very scary he goes hey listen I I know you guys think you can interpret my dream but if you if you get it wrong I'm gonna cut your head off they go Let's find a real disciple here. Who's we got a real we wouldn't stop the faking it here. So they find they, they call Daniel. And Daniel has confidence in his God. And Daniel goes, Oh, I can interpret the dream for you. I'm not worried about you trying to kill me. I'm not worried about that. I can interpret it for you. Kind of like a disciple having true confidence in the word of God. I can tell you what the word of God says. That's that, that's in a sense what Daniel's doing. And he tells him the interpretation. So we pick it up in verse 31. He says, and this is Daniel talking to the king. He says, you look, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. You know, the word, it's great to know that the word awesome is in the Bible. You know, awesome should feel awesome about that right there. There he is. Is he here? Is awesome here? There he is. There he is. There he is. Okay, there he is. Okay. Hopefully you're still feeling awesome, bro. Okay, there we go. Great. Great. I just want to check right there. Okay. Uh, it says, <laughs> an enormous statue, enormous, uh, awesome in appearance. It says, the head of the statue was made of what? Pure gold. Does it say the whole body was pure gold? No. The head is pure gold. Now, we know Nebuchadnezzar was prideful because as, as we look at this text, we find out 
that there were several different descending orders of metals. But if you look at Daniel chapter three, the Bible says in this verse one, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high. That means he ignored the word of God. God told him exactly what the kingdom of God would be like and that he would only be the head. But he made the whole stature. He made it all about him. See, the kingdom of God is not all about you. You may be a part of it, but it's not all about you. And what happened with Nebuchadnezzar in the end? He wound up going mentally insane. See, when you won't go by the word of God, you start having mental illness. OK, a lot of people have mental illness because they won't go by the Bible. It isn't because the world is just different nowadays. No, you just won't go by the Bible and, and, and God gives you over to mental illness. That means you need spiritual health. You need mental health. The word of God can clean up your mental health. Chemicals may help some, but the Bible can clean up your mental health. It can help you to think right. It can help you to dream right. It can help you to say the right stuff to yourself. The Bible can clean up your mental health. And so, so, so we go back to the prophecy and we see that Nebuchadnezzar is only the head of gold. You guys see that? It says its chest and its arms made of what? Silver. So we see the metals are descending in order. Daniel's interpreting it. Its belly and thighs were what? Bronze. Its legs of what? Iron. And its feet of iron and partly baked clay. It says, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, not by human hands. If it's not the hand of humans, it's the hand of what? Hand of God. It says, it struck the statue on its what? Its head, chest, thighs, feet. So this rock that was cut out by God, God's rock struck the feet. It says it struck the feet. It says then the iron, the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like shaft on the threshing floor of the summer. Shaft is what's thrown away. So all these other kingdoms get thrown away. It says the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a small pebble, became a little Bible talk. You know, people talk about, I don't want to make a church. That's because you don't have mega faith. Right? We're not talking about the false teaching churches, but I want to make a church. I got a lot of faith. I want a lot of people saved. A lot of people like small churches because they don't want to have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, church is getting too big. Who are you? You're talking about the church is getting too big. No, your head is getting too big. A lot of people need to be saved. Right? You just don't want to work on your people skills and reinvent yourself and build friendships because a lot of new disciples are coming in there out cranking you. You got to keep mega faith right there. Are you with me right here? We want a big church. Right here it says the kingdom came a huge mountain and filled only England. No, this mountain filled what? The whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, wherever you live. He has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. And we know who was leading at this time. It was who? Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, though. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar. So you draw a statue and you make the gold Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? After you. So after the Babylonian Empire. After you, after the Babylonian Empire, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours, highlighted by the descending amount in the quality of the material, silver, okay? Inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of a clay, partly of iron. So this will be a what kind of kingdom? A divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of the iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly of iron, or partly iron, and partly clay. So this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. So right here it tells you the kingdom can be partly brittle, specifically this one. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture of the same race. No, it just says a mixture and will not remain united any more than the iron mixed with clay. In the time of those kings, the last king, the one iron and clay, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will what? 
never be destroyed. So part of the, so we find out something about this kingdom. It's eternal. Because if it can't be destroyed, it must be eternal. Okay? But it says in the time of those kings, the God will, the God of this earth will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will self endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has showed the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. And the church said, this is always, this was one of the most faith-building Bible studies I did in my entire life. When I saw world history that I was taught in school, in the Bible, these kingdoms are predicted before they happen. And that's exactly what happened. How in the world would Daniel know that? How would Daniel know that after this kingdom would come the Medo-Persian Empire? How would Daniel know after, this, after the Medo-Persian would come Alexander the Great? You remember Alexander the Great, right? He's represented as bronze. And when you draw your statue, you draw the different metals. Okay? You draw the statue and you go, Nebuchadnezzar, he runs, uh, he's in charge right now. He would be in charge of the Babylonian Empire. Next would be the Medo-Persian Empire. Medo-Persian Empire is important because that's where we get crucifixion. It was the Persians that came up with crucifixion. Okay? Way before uh, the Romans used it powerfully, the Persians actually came up with it. They love to torture. So the Medo-Persian Empire is the bronze. It's represented by bronze in this statue. Then you get to the Roman Empire. Okay? The Roman Empire. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Then you get to the Bronze Empire with Alexander the Great. And uh, Alexander the Great conquered the world at like 31 years old. And History records that he is heard in his tent, weeping and crying. You know why? There no, no, there's nothing more to conquer. He had conquered the world. So he's so that highlights that faith doesn't come from making disciples. Faith comes from the word of God. You don't put your faith in miracles, even though faith gives and miracles give faith. You put your faith in God. OK, and so he conquered the whole world and was still depressed because there's no more worlds to conquer. He would represent the bronze and then, of course, the last would represent the Roman Empire because the Romans didn't care what you believe, as long as you pay us money. Okay? Now, there was a city that the Romans created, you may have heard of, it's called Londinium. Right? Because the Romans loved the inter, inter multicultural thing. You could be a Muslim, you could be a Christian, you could be elder, you could do whatever you wanted to do, as long as you paid us taxes. And sadly, that's still how London is. You could do anything here. Right. But do you better not? I remember we moved here, man. We didn't pay to count. We didn't even know about council tax. We didn't pay council tax. I had like people at my door. Like about to, I'm like, what are you guys doing? OK, fine. Here's your council tax. They, they were so hard line on council tax. Right. And th there's still those sentiments that still play into London. But we see right here some things about the kingdom of God. First of all, it's going to come in chapter two, verse one. We see in the last days. OK. We see, uh, or not uh, in Isaiah 2, it says in the last days, but here we see that all these different, different kingdoms are, are represented, but the kingdom of God will never be destroyed. He says that in verse 44, okay? How in the world did Daniel know Isaiah and Isaiah know Daniel? They couldn't, okay? How would, how would Isaiah be able to predict that it would happen in the last days and then Daniel predict that it would happen in the time of the Roman Empire and, and, and how? Because the Bible is prophetic. Those are two puzzle pieces. Now let's go to the New Testament. Let's go all the way to 25 AD. God has gotten so angry with his people. He's exiled them. He sent them prophet. They didn't listen. He sent them priests. They didn't listen. He sent them kings. Most of them were corrupt. So then God went silent for 400 years. Highlighting that style is never the issue. God sent every single type of style. Now he sends Jesus who was prophet, priest, and king. And they killed him. It's never about style. We get to Matthew in chapter three and God has gone silent for 400 years because people wouldn't listen. You know, that's a scary place to be if God goes silent on you. If you're not getting anything out of your quiet times, if he's gone silent, it could be because he is, you, you, you're in exile. God has gone silent on his people for 400, not 100 years, 400 years. Where would the world be at for 400 years if you heard no Christian principles on anything? I don't even want to think about it. It's unimaginable. Matthew chapter three. 
Verse 1. After 400 years of silence, God raises up a man to shatter the silence for the sake of the kingdom. And so the time is 25 AD. And the Bible says in verse 1, in those days, John the Baptist came, and came preaching the desert of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. No, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, why does he say kingdom of heaven? Because Matthew writes the account for the sake of the Jews. Jews were so in awe of God, they wouldn't even say the word God. So they said heaven. But kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are the same thing. Okay? So when Matthew writes his account, he uses the word heaven. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Oh, my goodness. Remember, Isaiah talked about the kingdom. You remember that? Daniel talked about the kingdom. And so now John comes in 25 AD talking about the kingdom. And he says the kingdom is what? Near. If it's near, has it come? Okay, let's go a couple more years. Into, let's go to chapter four. Okay, so we know the kingdom didn't come during John the Baptist's life. Let's look at chapter four. Okay, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? Near. If it's near, has it come yet? No. So the kingdom didn't come in the lifetime of Jesus. Let's keep proving that. Turn to Mark chapter nine. Kingdom did not come during the lifetime of Jesus. Mark chapter nine. Verse one. And he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of come. Kingdom of God come with what? Wimpiness, passivity, power. So when the kingdom of God comes, what's it going to come with? Power. And of course, this one here says some people won't be there. So one, somebody from Jesus' ministry is going to be dead. Someone's going to be dead. And the Bible says some who are standing here will not, or will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. This is some. That means somebody will taste death. Before they see the kingdom. And the Bible says it's going to come with power. Going to come. But if it's going to come with power, has it come yet? Hasn't come yet. Hasn't come yet. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. These are all puzzle pieces. And you have to preach this kind of like I'm doing to help people understand the kingdom. John chapter 3 in verse 1. Okay. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Okay. Now, Nicodemus is a Greek name, meaning he was most likely very well educated. Uh, and then the Bible says, a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night. We call him Nick at night. Okay. <laughs> Nick at night. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Jesus is not just a teacher who's come from God. He's God who's come to teach. Jesus is not only a teacher who's come from God. He's a God who's come to teach. OK, says we know that you're a teacher. I hope Jesus is not just a teacher. I hope he's your God. Some people just want him just uh, teach me, but he's not my God. Says we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. For no one can perform miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. I mean, the religious people are always very arrogant. He puts himself on an equal playing ground with God. OK, we know that you're a teacher. who, You know, so th there's a little bit of arrogance there. Says in reply, uh, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Everyone can see the kingdom of God if he hasn't born again. No. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is what? Yeah. Born again. How can a man be born when he is old? See, this is the problem with religious people. They take literal scriptures figuratively and figurative scriptures literally. He's not saying to be born again. We see it in the Bible, right? So don't be shocked when you get people that take literal scriptures figuratively, right? I had someone say, yeah, but the Bible says if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, I go, that's hyperbolic language. When is where? Show me the scripture where angels are speaking in tongues. It's an exaggerated statement to make a point. We do it nowadays, right? You do it. You exaggerate to make a point, right? You go, man, I am so I'm hungry enough to eat a Cadillac trunk full of midgets. We don't have Cadillacs over here, do you, in America? That's an exaggerated statement to make a point. 
You see what I'm saying? Jesus has a lot of that throughout his teachings. Okay? All right? I am so hungry. I can eat up all the food in every single Jamaican restaurant in all of London. I mean, you're not going to really do that, but exaggerated statement to make a point. I am so hungry. I can eat pie and mash. To, you know, exaggerated statement to make a point. Okay? So it's hyperbolic language. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of what? Water and spirit. So part of entering the kingdom of God is being born again. So you cannot enter the kingdom of God, kingdom of God without being born again. He says right here, it says flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be what? Born again. So right here is another puzzle piece. You can't get into the kingdom unless you're born again. And you're born of water. And what else? Spirit. The Greek word for water is rainwater. Now, we don't have to deal with it here, but in America, you got people, yeah, it could have meant his, it could mean the water from the umbilical cord. You know, people get all weird. They try to literally, you have people that try to teach that. Here, it's very clearly talking about what? Baptism. You can't enter the kingdom unless you're baptized. But has the kingdom of God come? No, look at Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. That's just telling you how to get in. John said it's coming, but it didn't come. Jesus said it's coming, but it didn't come. Then John, uh, the book of John says you got to be baptized to get into it. And then you look at the book of Luke. And what does Luke say in chapter 17? About the kingdom of God. Looking at puzzle pieces. Luke 17. In verse 20, the Bible says very clearly, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is what? It is in your midst or it's within you. The Greek word is in your midst, uh, but it means it's within you. The kingdom of God. This I love the double meanings on what Jesus says. He says the kingdom of God is in your midst, but it's within you. Now, who is in their midst? Jesus. Jesus was in their midst. See, the kingdom of God, when you study with people, you can tell them that. You can go, you know, sometimes we don't realize the kingdom of God is in their midst and they don't even see it. Why? Because you are the kingdom of God. You're a disciple. Does that make sense? And so Jesus was telling them the kingdom of God is in your midst and they still didn't see it. They still didn't see it. Also, the kingdom of God is within you because when you get baptized, you get the Holy Spirit. OK, but just because it's in your midst, has it come yet? It hasn't come yet. Now, we go to another scripture that talks about how you open the doors to the kingdom. Look at Matthew chapter 16. How do you open the doors to the kingdom? Matthew 16 says this here. I referenced this earlier today in the lesson. In verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Okay, now what's cool about this particular area historically is this area was known at that time as having a huge rock that was there, uh, a large rock. Uh, it was a, a rock face. It was known as the rock of the gods. Okay, the rock of the gods. Jesus takes them to a place that has the rock of the gods and he's going to say, no, I'm the God of the rocks. <laughs> Jesus, so Jesus got wordplay. He is incredible. I love Jesus. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, are any of those people alive that Jesus just referenced? No. How impactful Jesus was that nobody was alive that you could compare him to. How do you want to be remembered? Who do people say Owen was some say he was like Napoleon. Some say he was, you know, who do you want to be remembered as? Do you want to be remembered as somebody who can't be compared to anybody living? That's how Jesus was compared. All these individuals are radical, radical people. And he says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? 
Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Ding, 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 ding. What do we have for Simon Peter right there? Keys for the key. I mean, he wins the prize. You know, sometimes you just nail it. He nails it. He goes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, Peter means Petros, small rock. Okay. He says, you are Peter. You are a small rock. But on this rock, Petra, the big rock, which means Jesus. Okay. On the big rock. Okay. It says on this rock, you will build my church. I will build my church. He says, Peter, you're just a small rock, but I'm going to build my rock. I'm going to build my church and it's going to be built on me. That's how awesome Jesus is. He can say it's all about me. You can't say that, but Jesus can. Jesus can go, it's all about me. I'm going to build my church on, on, on my rock and you're going to be the small pebble that does it. Now, he says, I will give who the keys? Who? Who has the keys to the kingdom? Paul? No. Moses? No. Jesus? No. Jesus doesn't even have the keys. Jesus goes, no, I'm going to give them to you. What do keys do? They open doors. And when we see the coming of the kingdom, you're going to find that in both cases, the door was opened by Peter. The door was opened for the Jews and all the Gentiles. That's, every, that's all nations. In both cases, Peter is going to be there with the keys to unlock the door of faith for the Jews and for the Gentiles. So Peter has the keys. And the kingdom of God will be built on Christ. Now, in building a building, what's the most important thing to build? The windows? The roof? Okay, so what's the foundation of the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three tells you the foundation. OK, foundations are important. Right. Men don't understand foundations in buildings and sisters, you understand foundation, right? Yeah, we all understand foundations. Just, I, I, you know, I need my foundation. I mean, sisters know about your foundation, right? OK, so first Corinthians chapter three, <laughs> verse 11 says this here. Right. I mean, you don't do anything without the foundation. Right, sisters? You go for the foundation first. Right. You got to work the foundation. And before you. Know, OK, there we go. I just want to make sure got sisters in the house here. Verse 11. <laughs> for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid. Which is what? Joseph Smith. The foundation of the kingdom is Allah. Allah. No, that's the L.I.V. version of uh, you know, the lie version, L-I-E. Okay, the foundation of the kingdom is who? Jesus. So the foundation of the kingdom is Jesus. Okay, let's go back to Luke chapter 23. A couple more puzzle pieces, and then we're going to see the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. In Luke 23, we have another scripture. Because we're still waiting for the com coming of the kingdom. We, I mean, we see all these, oh, it's going to come with power. Oh, it's going to come in the last days. All the nations are going to stream to it. Somebody's going to be dead when it comes. All these great pieces, but it, we still don't have a clear sign of all these things crescendoing into one moment. We still don't have that. Okay? And Jesus is still alive. Well, let's go to see what happens when Jesus is dead. Okay? Look at Luke 23. And let's find out if the kingdom came during the life of Jesus. Luke 23, verse 50. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Joseph. Yeah, named Joseph, a member of the uh, member of the of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to the decision and their action. He came from Judea, from the town of Arimathea. And he was waiting for what? He's waiting for the kingdom of God. Okay. Going to Pilate. He asked for whose body? Okay. Did the kingdom of God come? No. Why? Because Jesus is dead. So the kingdom of God didn't come during the lifetime of Jesus. Because Jesus is dead. And this guy's still waiting for the kingdom. So the kingdom of God must have come after Jesus died. 
How do we know that? Well, it's right here. This guy's waiting for the kingdom of God and Jesus already died. There are people that teach you the kingdom of God came during the time of Jesus. It did not. This guy is still waiting for the kingdom of God and, and, and Jesus has already died. And the Bible says he asked for Jesus' body, right? Then he took it, wrapped it in linen and cloth and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which he had uh, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. So this was his own garden tomb, okay? So Jesus went from a virgin womb to a virgin tomb. That's Jesus. Jesus is smooth, isn't he? He went from a virgin womb to a virgin tomb. And Joseph from Arimathea was very rich. You need rich guys in the church. Rich guy was able to bury Jesus. But we have another puzzle piece. We have a guy waiting for the kingdom of God to come, and Jesus has died. Clearly, biblically, the kingdom did not come during the lifetime of Jesus. Chapter 24 gives us one last puzzle piece. It says in chapter 24, in verse 44, remember the title of the lesson today. It's what? The coming of the kingdom. It has the kingdom come yet? No, we've seen a lot of scriptures so far, but the kingdom still has not come. When is the kingdom going to come? We'll find out. Luke 24, in verse 44, the Bible says this here. It says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. Christ will suffer and rise from the dead and on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. To how many nations? Beginning where? Wow, man. Isaiah said something's going to happen in Jerusalem. Isaiah said something's going to be preached in Jerusalem. And right here, Jesus died. He opened their minds and he says, you are witnesses. Okay. Of these things, I'm going to send you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from where? Your prayer life. No, power from where? On high. In other words, power that has come from God. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached first in Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. But even though that's going to be preached, this scripture just says what's going to happen. And this scripture just highlights a few more characteristics of the kingdom. But has the kingdom of God come? No, it hasn't. So now let's go to the book of Acts and we're going to see all these puzzle pieces come together and highlight that the kingdom of God came specifically at 2930, well, technically 33 AD. We'll say that for round numbers, 33 AD. So let's look at the fulfillment of all these scriptures. Acts chapter one. Okay. Acts chapter one says this here, in the beginning, oh, no, that's John chapter one, <laughs> Acts chapter one. <laughs> in the beginning was the word of God. Word of God. Okay. Acts chapter one, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until he was taken to, that's exactly what we do. We do it and teach it until we're taken to heaven. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Until the day he was taken to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Jesus does follow up. If Jesus does follow up, how much more so you? He appeared to them over a period of how many days? 40 days and spoke about dating. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about science. He appeared to them over 40 days and spoke to them about family. No, 40 days he spoke about what? The because the kingdom hadn't come. How important is it if Jesus came back and for 40 days he spoke about the same thing? The kingdom of God is arguably the most important thing. 40 days, God who made the world spoke about the kingdom. He didn't even speak about, he could have spoke about sin. He could have spoke about all kinds of, he spoke about the kingdom. Can you imagine? Hey, bro, I, you know, I got a question about the kingdom of God. 
Hey, bro, you know this brother hurt my feet. The kingdom of God. Hey, I just want to know who I'm going to get married to. The kingdom of God. You know, the brothers aren't really leading. The kingdom of God, sis. You know, I haven't really found a good church. The kingdom of God. I really was hurt by what you said. The kingdom of God. Every, just the kingdom of God. Surely they would have got it that it's about the kingdom of God, right? <laughs> Verse six. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are we waiting for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Israel? Even though he spoke to them for 40 days, they still didn't get it. Because they go, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> didn't he say kingdom of God in like 40 days? Man, disciples can be dull, can't we? 40 days, the same sermon. They go, kingdom of Israel? Kingdom of Israel. Didn't he, did, how many times do I got to go do it? How many times do I got to tell you? Kingdom of God. Because they were so culturally wound up. They were looking for a political kingdom. Okay, they wanted political deliverance. They thought the kingdom was all for them. Okay, so they still want an ethnically restricted kingdom. Right? There are still people like that. They want an ethnically restricted kingdom. But an ethnically restricted kingdom is not the kingdom of God. If you grew up going to all black church, you have not grown up in the kingdom of God. That's an ethnically restricted thing. If you went to all white church and it was, oh, yeah, you know, Catholic, oh, oh, oh. no, the kingdom of God is all nations. All nations. You know how you go to the market and you see like everybody in the market. That's the kingdom of God. You got the quiet people, the loud people, the funny people, the crazy people, the weird people, everybody. You know, we're all there. Right. The kingdom of God is a hodgepodge of everybody. And he had to speak to them 40 days because, you know, they didn't get it. They were just listening, listening and not really letting it. They were six inches from radical. The distance from the head to the heart. Six inches. And so. He says, they say, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them. It is not for you to know about times or dates. The father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. Uh Oh, you receive what power? power. Uh Oh, that was one of the puzzle pieces. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before them before their eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. You know, we got to be a going church for a coming Christ. We got to be a going church for a coming Christ. As they saw Jesus going, they go, we better get going. We better have something going when he comes back. We better have the kingdom established when he comes back. And of course, Jesus goes into the sky. And then, of course, the Bible says, in those days, in verse 15, Peter did what? Stood up among the believers, a group numbering how many? Now, who's got the keys to the kingdom? Peter's got the keys to the kingdom. And what he does right here is he stands up and he starts preaching the word of God. And they raise up a new guy to take over the ministry because somebody gets killed. He kills himself. Who was that? Judas. Uh Oh, another puzzle piece. Jesus said, some will not what? Taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with what? Power. Jesus just got to say, wait for the power. So that's a puzzle piece. Judas is dead. And the Bible says, Judas went where he belonged. And of course, the question is, where do you belong? Where do you belong? You know, some of you belong in the ministry. You belong in the ministry. That's where you belong. Especially the quiet ones. The ones that aren't saying amen right now. Yes, sir. The ones that are really silently counting the costs that are thinking about it. Uh, you may need to hear it 40 days more and then maybe you start realizing it. But where do you belong? Judas belonged in the ministry, but he made a choice that was fatal. And so they raised up another person. And so we already see some puzzle pieces. We see Peter's got the keys. We see the power. We see someone hasn't died. And we see this prophecy that they will preach to all nations that Jesus tells them. So let's look at the fulfillment of the rest of them. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It says, in the last days. Wow, the last days does not mean the last days of mankind. It means the last days of the Jewish temple. 
Okay, where only Jews were saved, where only the kingdom was about Israel. So the last days, now we need to live our lives as if we are in the last days. But the last days does not mean the last days of mankind. Don't let anyone tell you that kind of weird stuff. When the tribulation come, God's going to set up the kingdom. That is false teaching. The word tribulation just means persecution. That's all it means, suffering, when the suffering comes. Okay, that's all tribulation means, suffering. They make it like this big old thing, like God's going to come back and then establish his kingdom. No, the kingdom gets established right here in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. We've already seen a couple of puzzle pieces, a, 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 a couple things fulfilled. Jesus talking to them about power. They're in Jerusalem. Somebody has died. And right here he says, in the last days. Who said that the kingdom's going to come in the last days? Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 2. Okay, he says, in the last days. Okay, he says, I will pour out my spirit on how many people? All people. He says, all people. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire and billows of snow, uh, smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. The moon will be blood before the coming and the great glorious day of our Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth is a man credited to you by signs and miracles. By miracles, uh, wonders, and signs which God did among you. Through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. So he's preaching the word of of God and he lays it on out and then he says this here in verse 36 therefore let all Israel be assured of this he says therefore let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified both Lord and Christ okay Lord means controller and Christ means savior a lot of people want Jesus as their savior they just don't want him as their controller Jesus has to be Lord of all or he can't be Lord at all. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He's got to be Lord in the midst of persecution. He's got to be Lord of your marriage, Lord of your dating, Lord of your job, Lord of your wallet, Lord of your emotions. He's got to be Lord of your culture. It's not about your culture. It's about kingdom culture. He's got to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He says he's made this Jesus. Who, and you notice Lord and Savior are interconnected can't have one without the other. A lot of people want to be saved. They say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm saved, but I just haven't found a church. No, no, you're not saved. Okay. You cannot, you cannot separate Jesus, the head from Jesus, the body. What happens if you separate the head from a body? Both are dead. You can't kill Jesus again, right? So you can't claim to have a relationship with Jesus and not have a relationship with the body of Jesus. Okay. So when people say that to you, that's a red flag. They're not right with God. Peter replied, repent and be what? Uh-oh, remember what Jesus said is going to be preached in Jerusalem? Repentance and forgiveness. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of who? Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and all your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourself. Right here, it's very clear. Man is tantamount in his salvation. Okay? You have to do something. Okay, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And the church said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Some of them were filled with awe. No, it says everyone. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by, all the, by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he has need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. And the church said, Amen. right here, it's confirmed. All of the prophecies come crescendoing into this moment. The coming of the kingdom happened at the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1 and 2 highlight all the prophecies we looked at coming into fulfillment. Are they in Jerusalem? Yes. Are they in Zion? Yes. Are all nations there? Yes. Because this was the Sabbath. This, or this was the time of the celebration of the Sabbath where uh, the death angel passed over the, the doorpost 
uh, from the Old Testament when the Israelites had the blood put on their doorposts to indicate that they were saved. That's a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus covering over your sins when the death angel comes. And so right here, we have all nations coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So we have all nations. We have Jerusalem. We have power because we heard earlier, uh, I didn't read it, but could have read it, uh, that the Holy Spirit came on them without warning. They didn't pray for the Holy Spirit. It came on them without warning. They weren't praying and then they get it. So you can't pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Bible says without warning. So you can't, uh, you can't tell God what to do. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. No, without warning, the power came on them. They get immersed in God's power, immersed in, that's what it means to be baptized, to be immersed in the power of God. They get immersed in the power of God. So you got Jerusalem, you got the power of God, you got some who will not taste death. Judas is dead. You got all nations are there, like it was said. You got the last days. This is the last days because as soon as they evangelized the world by 69 AD, the year after that, the temple gets destroyed by Titus. He destroyed the entire temple and the whole religious system. And at that particular time, the Jews are like, dang, I guess the kingdom is not just about Israel. It's about all nations because they had evangelized all nations. You have everything coming. It's an eternal kingdom because once you get baptized into it, you go to heaven. So yes, it's heaven, but it's also on earth. The kingdom of earth is a colony on, of heaven on earth. So you, you, you have all these prophecies. That, you know, Daniel said in the time of those kings, what, what, what empire is it? The Roman Empire. Okay. And the, the clay and the, and, the, and, the, and the iron represents the Roman Empire, which was a mixture of people. And this is the time of the Roman Empire where all the other kingdoms get destroyed. And the only uh, kingdom that can last eternally is the kingdom of God. This is the fulfillment of all the prophecies. The kingdom of God came approximately 33 AD in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Look how much... Look, look what God went through for the kingdom. Look how much he had to, look how, how long, why is it, you see why it's important? God went through all of this just to tell you what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is the church. The kingdom of God is the church. Matthew, who has the keys, he gives them to him. He says, hey, you, you know, you're going to have the keys of the kingdom of God. And on this rock, I will build my church. So he uses kingdom and church interchangeably. The kingdom of God is the church. Okay, the word church means called out. Ecclesia, those called out of darkness into the light. Okay, so the kingdom is the church. What does Jesus say about the kingdom? Look at Matthew 6, verse 33. Last scripture. Not only do we need to be devoted to the fellowship, devoted to the, to, to the, to, to the breaking of bread and to the meals, devoted to prayer. We got to be devoted to the kingdom. It says in Matthew 6 and verse 33. It says, but seek first. Whose kingdom? Your kingdom. You do that. You're Nebuchadnezzar. You start having mental illness. That's what happened. When you seek your kingdom, mental illness is right around the corner. I'm not trying to make fun of it, but I've seen it happen in the kingdom. I have seen this scripture. I'm not just saying this to you guys. I took a guy on a mission team with me in L.A. Five talent, top athlete, amazing guy. He didn't want he made the kingdom all about himself. And he wound up having mental illness, losing his brain, getting a disease, falling away, messing around with a girl, all this crazy stuff. It broke me in tears. I left to come plant this church here, and I couldn't do nothing for him but pray for him because he just messed his life up. He started going mentally crazy, hearing voices, all this kind of stuff because he got himself in the Sin can lead you to mental illness. Don't believe that everyone who has mental illness is there's not sin that was before it. That's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, okay? It's not about you. It says, but seek first his kingdom. And who else's righteousness? Yours? His righteousness. Okay? His righteousness. The Greek word for righteousness is, is dikasun. It means the state of being in the correct moral position with God. Okay? You got to seek not only the kingdom as first. So what's, what, does it say seek second the kingdom? So is the kingdom over your school? Seek first what? So is the kingdom more important in your school? Yes. Is the kingdom more important in your parents? Yes. Am I telling you that or is God telling you that? Is the kingdom more important than Manchester United? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than Zara? Yes. 
Is the kingdom more important than Primark? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than Vinted? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than Craigslist than Gumtree? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than ESPN? Da -na -na, da -na -na. Is the kingdom more important than the BBC? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than Storm Z? Yes. Is the kingdom more important than ev it, what's first? The kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. And his righteousness. You know, if you go up to someone in London, you go, hey, this is my girlfriend. We've been together 10 years. Faithful to her. <laughs> Someday I'm going to get married to her. People, oh, bless. No, God is like curse. You're not supposed to have a girlfriend. You don't sleep with someone if you're not married to them. Righteousness is defined by God, not by the country you live in. So that's why it's his right. You got to teach people this. You got to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. I learned a lot when I studied the Bible. They study with me and they go, man, you're very prideful. I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> they go, that's a sin. Oh, it is? They go, yeah, you're in sin. That's terrible. Like Satan struggled with pride. I was like, oh, really? I didn't even know what pride was. Because pride was so glorified in the fields that I was in. You're seen as awesome if you're prideful. and No one can tell me anything and blah, blah, blah. You got to teach people that they got to seek first not only the kingdom, the church, but they also got to seek what is righteous in the eyes of God. What is righteous in the eyes of God? Not righteous in their eyes, not righteous in their parents' eyes, but righteous in the eyes of God. Seek first his kingdom. That is the kingdom of God. Study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.